We are live. Data storytellers. Today on the show, I have with me Micah van den Branden, who is the associate director and uh, the data and data insights and analytics leader over at CompareTheMarket.com. Micah, welcome to the show. Thank you. Nice to be here. Fantastic. So today we'll talk about all things uh, data. I'm mostly interested in Micah's professional journey and also her take on the industry and especially maybe some communications insights in terms of aligning an organization to become more data driven. So Micah, first of all, just before we get into any of the, uh, any of the juicy topics, uh, you do have a strong background uh, in data. Would you mind uh, giving a short introduction into what led you into data and your role currently? Yes, of course, Lazar. Um, so analytics has always been my bread and butter. Um, I graduated from Leuven University in Belgium with a master's degree in marketing, majoring in market research. And then during a student's job at the market research firm over the summer, I realized I wanted to specialize even more. So I applied to this one year marketing, uh, marketing analytics degree in, at the University of Ghent, also in Belgium. And that one year program um, focused on a mix of market research, marketing and data science. And even though I already knew um, SQL for my first years in uni, I now really understood the power of coding in combination with statistical modeling. And I learned to code in SAS, build segmentations, regression models. And I was shipped off to England for a placement at a um, loyalty company called Dunhumby. And I really found my passion there. Um, data analytics for loyalty programs in retail. And so I ended up working throughout the years for Tesco through Dunhumby, but also um, for Sainsbury's through EMEA and then a lot of other loyalty programs for retailers, small, um, international retailers like ICA, Sobeys, Migros. I worked for one of Belgium's largest retailers, Deleuze, and in between all that I did a stint at Accenture as well. And so my current role is the first time where I work in insurance, but I'm, I'm still doing exactly what I love. So I lead a team of around 40 data uh, professionals across data science, analytics, insights, which is market research, market intelligence, social media analytics, but also digital analytics and optimization, which is your A-B testing on website. And the variety I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is inspiring. It's fun. The best days at work are the days where we talk about methodologies for data science projects, or we get results back from a market study about customer sentiment, um, post-COVID, for example, or get results back from some successful A-B tests on the website. So yeah, I'm, I'm I'm still very much in, in the analytics field, even though I'm not coding hands-on anymore now. Oh, great. So uh, you've seen a lot, you know, you uh, kind of climbed the ladder and you worked in different areas with data, the data and that time that you spend there, it's, uh, it's a very long time in the 21st century, especially, especially when we talk about data analytics. So I would be interested in hearing your take on the industry today. First of all, how did you see the industry transform and change over the past couple of years, maybe over the past decade? And also, what do you see as its true reality, as its greatest challenges and opportunities today? Yeah, it's funny that you say that, because indeed, in the last 15 years, I've seen quite a lot, I think. And um, to a lot of people, that still sounds like a very junior career, but I think in data science, I was quite long. Um, and I feel very archaic when I say I was coding in SAS because not a lot of people are doing that anymore these days. Um, but yeah, what I've seen, I've seen the industry explode. Um, the demand for insights, data, automated decision making is increasing in line with the accessibility to data, um, with the growth of online channels, the strides that are being made in technical domain, different coding languages, different cloud services, computing power, distributed computing. And so I've seen everything go move exponentially. Um, in terms of expertise, there are so many specialisms now that I don't think existed 15 years ago. Um, when I started working, we were just branded analysts. But then throughout my career, I've seen everything branch out into specialism. So we have campaign analysts, digital analysts, data scientists. Um, and on top of that, when, when you look at the job market, I think the way that people work with our job profile has changed as well. You can see people, um, a lot of companies still work with traditional analytics teams, servicing other teams, but a lot of companies are currently working in product development mode with squads and data scientists and analysts aligned to the squads. Um, I think you asked me in terms of the challenges. Um, one of the greatest challenges I think is that learning to code is easy now. Um, in a way, because there are so many online degrees or platforms that where it can be t 
taught and degrees can be earned. And I noticed that some people may think that being able to code in Python and apply a package on a data set turns you into a data scientist. And I, I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, I think it's um, still important that people really understand the maths and the stats behind the packages, that they know how to parameterize everything, what data transformations are required, the distributions of variables need to be looked at. And I wouldn't say I'm an expert at it either. I'm, I'm not a statistician. Um, I'm a mix of, of everything. But I do know from experience how volatile results can be when um, there is misunderstanding or when we haven't thought through any of that statistical detail behind it. Um, and on top of that, you also need um, business knowledge as well to apply. And for both um, the understanding of the data, but also for understanding how to apply the results of your model. And so I think as hiring managers in data and data science, it is important to really understand the qualifications of the people we hire. Um, there is so much demand and it's really hard to find good data scientists. And a lot of people I think will learn a lot in the jobs as well. So you can find real gems, people that have learned a lot online and are very good with coding um, and are happy to learn about the maths and the stats behind it. But in my opinion, that statistical knowledge is still ever so important to make sure we are doing the right things. Because in the end, big business decisions will lean on some of the models we build and we don't want that to be wrong. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that is one of the big challenges I, I personally see. Um, and then a final, another challenge is that I think the industry is increasingly getting stricter in terms of regulation about privacy and around mm. usage of data and which data are we still allowed to keep and use and for what purpose, um, how many people are still giving consent for their data to be used for those purposes that we want to use them for as businesses. Mm. And then for digital analytics, the cookie policies are making everything hard. People are... Um, fairly so able to decline a lot of the capturing of the data mm -hmm. but then again how much data do we still have to make decisions and understanding of how people navigate on websites so i think as a result as data and analytics teams we need to be increasingly smart and advanced about what we do with data and how we use it and why we use it um, and that is something that has changed massively over time as well mm -hmm. many more restrictions on on what we do mm -hmm. in our work that makes that makes perfect sense. And um, you mentioned the, the the data scientists, how the technical knowledge, while being absolutely necessary and fundamental to that work, you need additional skills. You maybe need additional competencies. You know, need you need additional knowledge. Uh, could you maybe comment a little bit more about uh, what this means? So, what do you see a good data scientist bringing to the table? apart from the technical knowledge and the coding capabilities? What kind of skills are we talking about here? We, we always say we're looking for unicorns because you don't only want a person who's very analytical and able to code data sets, apply statistical models, know a lot about statistical models, but we also need people that understand what we are trying to achieve, understand mm -hmm. the real business reasons. And hence, it has to be a person that also needs to be able to have good communications, be able to explain to non-technical audiences what they're doing, but equally understand from non-technical audiences what they want to achieve. And so you're really looking for a very rounded profile because um, I'm, I'm gonna be very stereotypical here, but a lot of analysts are very introverted people. Um, they, they don't like to be in big meetings. They, they'd rather be working on projects and then behind their computer. And I know that's very extreme, but it does mean that it's really hard to find a unicorn and especially I find it's harder when you work in consulting for an agency, when you have to work with clients, because you don't want to have to duplicate every resource because you think, should we send um, a more senior person every time with an analyst to a client for meetings? So I think finding the right balance between technical skills, knowledge, and, and being able to have conversations and speak with clients is what we always tend to look for in agency roles. And it's really hard to find people that are good at both mm -hmm. at the same time. Absolutely. And then maybe just uh, lingering here for another second. Um, from your perspective, again, you've seen a lot. So what are the main pitfalls of having someone who's more uh, 
uh, unidimensional, you know, who was a little bit uh, more tunnel visioned about working with data and stats. Because again, that, that is absolutely fundamental. That's where you bring the real value as purveyors of truth in the business with data, right? But if you can't really engage people with it, there are all kinds of uh, negative consequences of that. I'm just really curious about your take on that. What do you see as the main pitfalls of not having that widened perspective of not having a unicorn? Uh, what do you see as the main downsides of that today? I think it's mainly due or the main pitfall will be that people are unable to convince their stakeholders mm. about the value of what they found in the data. If you can't convey the right message, then you can't drive change. And then essentially your work has been for nothing. A lot of stakeholders that we work with or I've worked with in the past have a quite already have hypotheses in their head. They already think they know what's happening. And so often it's not just trying to do an analysis, it's trying to if if the results of your analysis don't fall in line with the hypothesis, you then need to convince people. And I think if you don't have a strong or you don't like that aspect of work, um, you might fail at convincing people that your data is right and that there is a story and that the story needs to be different so I think that is the biggest pitfall and that will probably lead to frustration for mm. those analysts because they have done a piece of work and it just falls on their ears. years mm. yeah that, that makes perfect sense and then this actually leads us to the the key question that we always always like to explore which is about storytelling we understand that storytelling is kind of like a buzzword you know, so we are using that also consciously, uh, but at the same time, there's a lot underneath because storytelling is ultimately exactly what you just mentioned. It's about persuading. It's about bringing something that you built to life in another person's imagination and world. And with key stakeholders, I mean, these guys uh, have to deal with a lot of different narratives floating around. You know, you can't really blame it on them if they can't immediately see all the potential in data. Uh, which you built up over you know, 10 years. You immediately see all the dots connected. You know what da data can do. And you think in that way. Now, uh, what are your best practices? What are your best tools to influence and persuade key stakeholders at different levels of the organization? I've never really thought about this question before, um, as in I didn't think I had actual tools or mm -hmm. a deliberate approach. Um, but if I think about it, I think I probably use a mix of, of three characteristics rather than tools. Um, one is credibility. One is um, understanding my audience, my stakeholders, and evidence-based approach. And by those three, I, I'll go into a bit more depth. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of understanding, I think it's easier to convince people if you really know what they're going through, what is important to them, and how can I appeal to them most. So try to look at it from their perspective. Um, the evidence-based approach is I will always try and convince with facts and data, not with emotion. And I'm always surprised, as I said before, how many people, how much business knowledge is still based on gut feeling, when in most cases, businesses will have the data that can help make the decisions or create a better understanding. And it's really hard for people to say no to cold hard facts when they are in front of you. Mm -hmm. So um, fact-based, evidence-based approach where possible. And then my final one was, um, I think I said credibility. Mm -hmm. um, when I work with people, I, I will try and build and create good relationships. Um, I want people to know that I deliver what I promise, that they can rely on me. And then over time, that creates a trusted relationship. And it's, I find it much easier to convince stakeholders when they know what's, what you stand for and, and that they can trust me. So mm -hmm. once I have that good relationship, some of the discussions that potentially were difficult otherwise become quite easy because people know they can trust you and they know that you won't be saying anything deliberately to make it their lives difficult. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, yeah. And uh, what you're also telling me is basically what I see, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's almost the makeup of the ideal data transformation leader, you know, someone who has a widened perspective, really well founded in technical knowledge, but at the same time has the ability to empathize with the audience and really align key stakeholders. Um, do you have any additional thoughts on this element of leadership? Because it's it's a loaded word, right, that we hear being thrown around all the time. But what do you think, and feel free to also uh, repeat yourself here, but uh, what do you think really makes a strong data transformation leader? What kind of qualities, what kind of uh, approach does that person take and what kind of results follow that? 
yeah, as, as I said, I think it requires to be being a good communicator and relationship builder. They those data transformation projects they require a huge amount of investment and time, and so the the data leader or transformational leader needs to get people on their side from a technical team to, to be able to support them, but also from business teams to understand their needs and the changes they will be going through. And I think being able to talk a good game and also build good relationships are critical. And then um, I think they, and people might disagree with me, but I think it helps me having coded myself and having struggled with big data sets and I, th I know everything's changed massively over 15 years and there will be other challenges than I experienced, but I think it helps me to understand the struggles that data teams are going through. There's this saying that a lot of data projects are 80% time is data cleaning and data prep and only 20% time is actual modeling. Um, I haven't seen that changed in every company I've worked for. That is still the biggest struggle that a lot of data scientists and analysts struggle with. But if you don't understand that, you'll keep challenging their timelines and you'll keep not ex accepting the way they're working and it might cause frustration. Um, I don't think the data leaders need to be hands-on in their job. I don't think that's possible, but understanding what tools to be used, what hurdles teams meet, um, it's essential to develop a good understanding and be able to drive change both towards senior management, but also within the team. Um, and then I think a last characteristic or um, attribute for um, a, a great data and analytics transformation leader, I think is that they need to be detail oriented, but equally able to be go into a helicopter view and be strategic enough to see the forest to the trees, through mm -hmm. the trees, sorry. Um, data transformation projects can be really daunting and challenging and being able to, to go to a more strategic view to help make decisions is important whilst not ignoring all the details underneath, because there is a lot of detail underneath. We're talking about data structures and tables and KPIs and, and metrics, and it's, it's quite complicated and it's easy to get absorbed into it. But sometimes for decision-making, you really need to be able to step away as well and forget all that detail and not make that a blocking point to mm. make your digital transformation project move. So yeah, I think those are probably the main qualities that I think are expected these days of digital transformation mm. leaders. Absolutely. And those are great and well-rounded insights. And it's also being thrown around a lot uh, today how the 2020s will be the, the, the decade of data, right? And there's a lot of truth to that. And if you've been around for a while, you can see why that might be the case. And uh, uh, it's also obvious, as with every big trend like this, that there will be uh, you know, a lot of losers and a few winners, and there are immense opportunities and also risks in this. Now, I'm interested in your perspective on uh, what excites you most about the current trends in data. Is there anything, uh, it can be a technology, it can be a business trend, anything that you've seen develop over the past couple of years that makes you excited and optimistic about the future of the industry? I just, I like the fact that people start really understanding and seeing the, the true value in data and prioritizing data projects. Um, in my current company, we've, we've gone through a massive operating model change in how we are delivering projects internally. And we've gone to squad-based working. And it's really nice to see all of my team aligned to these squads and being able to really show off their skills in a very small group of people. and and that they are, they're independent. They, they mm -hmm. don't need to wait for decision-making. They can really do what they want with that group of people. Um, so I find that change to squad-based working really interesting to see. I think it creates additional autonomy and responsibility given to, to people. Um, I'm also very excited about all the technology develop, not the technology development, but the changes in platforms and uh, languages. And I'm, I'm trying to keep close to it and I really sometimes would like to have a whole day where I could play with it and code again. In my previous job I, I did manage to do some of that still and it kept me um, informed where now I really struggle and sometimes we'd really like to explore what's happening and how it's different from what I was doing and have things really changed that much. Um, yeah so those are thinking the main the fact that we can be make a big impact in businesses and businesses are really asking for that. It's um, 
data science is, is on a strategic agenda for competitive markets. So it's, it's really nice to see that change mm. happen. Exciting, exciting times in, in data for sure. And uh, thank you for your time, Micah. This was, uh, this was great. And maybe as a final, uh, final point, do you have any personal word of advice for aspiring data leaders now moving into the new decade or deeper into the, the new decade? What would you recommend aspiring data leaders to focus on in order to be successful? It's a good question. Um, it's also International Women's Day this week. Mm. And um, I was asked the same question, but from a female perspective by my own company. Um, and my piece of advice would be, especially to female data leaders, to not let anything stop you. Um, I'm a young mom myself, and I'm really trying to continue my career and develop myself whilst having a family and trying to look after my family as well. I have a husband who helps a lot too, so I can't complain completely. But I just want to tell people, you can make it work and don't give up. You always have a no, but you can have a yes if you ask for it. Um, I personally work 80%, so I'm able to spend one day per week with my children. Mm. Um, that might not last forever, but as long as there's so little, I find it important. Um, so from a female perspective, I think, and actually that works for men as well. I think mm. uh, we need to make it easier for people to grow a career and having families and it's not data related specifically, but I think keep fighting for the good cause there. Mm. Um, and, and from a data perspective, it's the world is changing, changing so quickly and so much. Um, I don't know if I can look in the future and say in five years time, where will we be? But I think just be flexible and keep adapting with technology, with changes in regulation. Um, and that way we'll, We'll find a way together. <laughs> Fantastic. That's, that's great advice, Micah. Thank you very much for your insights. And we hope to have you on the show, maybe in some other quality as well uh, in the future, sharing some of your war stories. Thank you very much and have a great day. You're welcome. You too, Lassen. Bye-bye.